you join me today at the wheel of one of the tiniest proper sports cars you can buy. Yes, I'm driving a Suzuki Cappuccino. Okay, now I feel tiny with that truck behind me. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. If you're one of those people who likes the original Mark 1 MR2, but looks at it and thinks, oh, it's just so big, and also has a bit of a thing for an MX-5, but again sits there and goes, how am I ever going to park this? then perhaps this could be the car for you. This is a 1994 Suzuki Cappuccino, and from 1991 to 1998, it was one of the very few actual sports car K cars. Now the Cappuccino was designed for two purposes. First of all, it was to bring a sports car into Suzuki's range. In the late 80s, they decided they want one. They had great sports bikes. Everyone knows Suzuki sports bikes are incredible, but no sports car at the time. And secondly, they wanted it to be a K car, as in a Japan only tiny car fitting into the city regulations, meaning it has to be ever so small, small engine, small capacity, limited power output. Everything is very heavily restricted, but it does give the engineers a real challenge and they come up with some incredibly inventive solutions to those restrictions. Sometimes it's actually better to give a designer a tight brief because they have to work within it and use their creativity to kind of push outside the box. So in terms of dimensions, it's obviously very, very tiny. It's 3,295 millimeters long and 1,395 millimeters wide. That's under four meters long, but 1.4 meters wide. It's tiny, it's absolutely tiny. And weight wise, it's also matchingly small, 725 kilograms. But it has to be light, obviously because it's small, but also because the engine is limited in capacity. The maximum limit is 660 cc's, and this is a 657, so it's three cc's below the limit. Now, although the monocoque, the shell of the car, is traditional steel, so it's nice and strong and tough and, you know, traditional, um, there's lots of weight saving with aluminium, the bonnet, the boot, the doors, those are all lightweight aluminium panels. Now, there are those who say it's not a sports car unless it's a convertible. In this case, this is a convertible, but it's also a T-top and a Targa and a closed coupe because it's got an amazingly innovative roof. At the moment, this rear glass area is folded back into the bulkhead in front of the boot. But this section here, the glass wraparound rear screen, the Targa top roof and sides that come up to the back of the B post, just fold down neatly like a pram top in one solid lump into here, then raise up to the vertical position and then click in place and then you've got a Targa. If you want to be a T-top, there's a center panel which sits in here and if it's bad weather, just put in the two T-top side panels and you've got yourself a closed coupe. This is every roof variation you can think of in one car. Now I know I get picked up for not always demonstrating roofs and uh, I've been left with the keys to this car and haven't been told how to put the roof back up again, so I'm not going to because I don't want to risk breaking it. Now development to production was fairly rapid. Work started on the project in 1987. A prototype was shown at the Tokyo Motor Show in 1989 and it actually went into production at Suzuki's Kosei plant in Japan in 1991. Now, although it was a Japanese-only market car, the British market is also right-hand drive. And pretty soon, people from Suzuki UK had seen the cappuccino, and they liked it, and they wanted to bring it here to the UK. It took 18 months to negotiate with Suzuki Japan to allow it to happen and then to make the relevant changes. There were 23 changes that had to be made to the car to suit UK road legislation and these were done partly in the factory at Kosai and partly at the import centre when they landed here in the UK. Then it was shown at the British Motor Show in 1992 where it went down a storm. Not only did it win the best sports car under £20,000, it won the best car in the show. So uh, yeah, reaction was good. Good I would say, yeah, definitely good. Now, because the car was doing so well in the home market in Japan, they only allocated 1,500 cars as the entire production run to the UK. And then because of import quota restrictions across the entire range, they cut back to 1,182. So less than 1,200 of these cars came to the UK in the first place. So any genuine UK car is a rare beast today. And they limited your options as well. Um, externally, you can only have two colours, silver or red, and they were sold in the majority of red and a sort of ratio of four to one. Although over in Japan, there were eight more colours available. And although they were right-hand drive, a few did creep over to Europe. Of the 1182 that was allocated to Suzuki UK, 82 apparently made it onto the continent. 
When you look at the car from the front, it doesn't look wide enough for two people. It's absolutely tiny. These big headlights take up about a third of the width of the bonnet each. And this little radiator grille is just ridiculously diminutive. Then you've got a big air intake underneath. But the whole design is just so utterly Japanese. It's rather wonderful when you get a Japanese market car that was never intended to go anywhere else in the world because they set their own home market influences and tastes and desires run things. There's no changing things to suit other tastes in other countries. Around the back, it's a similar story. With these great big bug-eye tail lights and this big lower grill area. It looks like a Pokemon face or something. Now, I believe this reversing and fog lights have been added for the British market down here because that's a regulation we have to have here in the UK, which isn't necessarily required in Japan. Now, looking at these wheels, they look so tiny. They're like little bicycle wheels. They are 165, 65, 14s. Obviously, they are the kind of thing you found on cars in the late 80s and early 90s because it's a car from the early 90s. But by modern sports car standards, they just look tiny. They look ridiculously small. However, they are in perfect keeping with the size of this car. Now, under the bonnet is actually quite an exciting little unit. It's a three-cylinder twin cam, four valve per cylinder, three-cylinder turbocharged intercooled engine, which makes 63 horsepower, which is the K upper limit for power output. Now, Suzuki have used their kind of motorbike engine know-how because this thing's got a red line of 9,300 because there's so little reciprocating mass in there. This being an earlier car from 1994, this is the F6 a motor in later cars became the K6A. In some other engineering uh, pluses about this car, it's got four wheel disc brakes, which is uh, pretty impressive for an early 90s sports car, especially with this size and this price category. And it's got an early version of speed sensitive power steering as well. Now, a slight twist to the story of the Cappuccino's success, its fall from grace, if you like, came in 1995 when new emissions regulations meant this old engine wasn't going to pass anymore and Japan didn't want to spend the money uh, engineering a new version for the UK, bearing in mind what that was going to cost for the number of units they were going to sell. So at that point, any cars that were not yet sold were registered to Suzuki and not have to go through a rehomologation process. Now to get into the boot you have to use the key so don't put them in there. It's not big at all obviously because it's not a big car. We do have this strap across the top to keep luggage safe. Normally there would be uh, bags to contain the roof elements that are not here and underneath the, the poppered floor there is a spare wheel and a jack. Right, so climbing into the cappuccino is a bit of a step actually because it's not a huge opening. The door sill is very high and if you've got more than size eight feet, which I have, there's not a lot of room for your toes and there's not a big gap between the steering wheel and the seat either so it's a bit of an effort to glide in gracefully. But once you are in you've got a sea of black leather, black soft touch plastic and black other plastic. It's basically a lot of black stuff going on. Now because the size limit of a K car is 3.3 meters and this is obviously below that there's not a lot of space inside here. You are quite close to the steering wheel, there's virtually no elbow room, you're kind of penned in a little bit in the seat and uh, yeah, everything is generally a little bit on the small side. It's kind of like driving a toy car, really. But then you don't go into this car expecting to be sort of in limo-like space. You're, you know what you're getting into. But also because it's like their plush luxury sports car version, it's also very comfortable and very nice. And I'm sitting in these lovely soft leather sports seats and this leather is absolutely lovely. It's really kind of soft, smooth touch and the uh, bucket seats wrap around you just enough to hold you comfortably. These sort of semi-integrated headrests are just behind you. So it's all yeah, I'm very comfortable. Indeed. The door cards also a, a nice padded black leather, so although you're fairly tight against them, they are soft and padded and feel really nice. In the doors, there's not a lot going on. We've got a little bit of stitching detail to add a bit of interest to it. Uh, you've got a solid plastic grab handle to pull the door shut, and it's a little kind of ring-like plastic door pull opening and closing, and of course, these very Japanese-style roll-over door locks. There's an absence of cup holders, but there is a lot of tea shelfery going on over here in front of the driver. Let me grab a cup. Right, so now I have a cup so I can demonstrate the T-shelfery of this vehicle. It's a big flat area, so a slightly grippy surface which is kind of soft, so you can place a cup on there for good T-shelf action. It's a little, almost imperceptible angle back down towards the car, so maybe you can park facing downhill slightly so you don't lose your drink into your lap or just place it carefully. So whatever you're drinking with it, tea, coffee, this is black coffee, a latte, or some other kind of, I'm trying to a coffee-based beverage that you could have in this car, if only I could think of one. But what to have with your frothy coffee on your big tea shelf? I don't know. Do I go with some kind of Japanese delicacy or to go with something more Italian? Because it's in a Japanese car with an Italian name, let's just split the difference and have Tonics tea cakes up there. That'll be lovely. Now, to the right of the big flat shelf area, we've got a lovely big semi-circular binnacle 
crowding the instruments. And we've got three going on here. The Speedo only goes up to 90 miles an hour. It's not got a lot of top end because it's a tiny engine that screams up to where it wants to go to. Then we've got the rev counter. Now at the bottom it says by 1000. This is because we've got single digits up as far as 10. Then it goes all the way to 12. The red line is at 8,500 RPM. Which is interesting because my book said 9,500. Although my research said a red line of 9,500, the actual Taco starts redlining at 8,500, but it does carry on all the way to 12. A 12,000 RPM engine in a car, that's, that's mad. That's incredible. I'm very, very, very impressed with that. So yeah, that's, that's quite something. Then to the right of that, we've got a small subdial, fuel temperature gauge, the usual. Not a lot of other instruments going on. Either side of that, we've got a couple of lights, the fog light switch for the rear fog, single rear fog, nothing on the front. And the other side, matching square switch for the uh, heated rear window. So when the back window is up, you can demist that on a chilly day. Next level down, we've got four of the dinkiest little air vents you've ever seen. The ones on the side are properly out of a toy car. The ones in the middle are more sort of normal size, but these little side ones, oh, they're so cute. Then we have the steering column. It's a fairly basic plastic shroud. It doesn't uh, go up or down or come out to you or anything like that. It's just fixed in place. It does have a big square hazard warning light on top. And then we've got our two instrument stalks, which interestingly are totally different in design. We're not even close to each other. The left-hand one is the wipers. Obviously a Japanese car pushing down to turn on rather than going up, which is a bit weird. Uh, but this this is a square obelisk. It's completely, well, end-to-end, -end, it's square with just a slight taper on the end. The one on the right-hand side is your indicators and headlights. Turn the knob on the end to get the lights on, flip it up and down for indicators, as they normally work. But it is round. It looks like something out of a Honda Civic. It's very unusual to have totally mismatched stalks on a car. Now, there are only two trim knobs in this car. One was called BA, I forget what the other one was called. The uh, BA got air conditioning, electric mirrors, and an airbag. This has air conditioning, but no airbag, and these mirrors do appear to be manual. I can't find a switch for them anywhere so I think this is the other option level. Electric mirrors were an option apparently but the steering wheel it's a proper old school sports car steering wheel. Chunky leather rim, flat fingers and a little horn in the centre. Let's do a quick horn test. <coughs> oh look at that that's brilliant that's so fun. That feels nice in your hands but it is set quite low so you do almost brush your legs against it quite a lot. Then moving over to the centre of the uh, the dashboard area, the console, we've got our heater and ventilation controls, which as I say, air conditioning on it, awesome. Lots of big slider switches, which are yeah, nice and easy and pretty much traditional stuff for Japanese market cars and a lot of British cars at that time. Then down to the radio, this is the original radio that came from the dealer with this car, a Clarion, what number is this? This is a Clarion CRX601R. This is actually rather a nice stereo. Um, I wonder if uh, Stone Cold had noticed if this disappeared because this looked really good in my Volvo. A nice radio cassette with Dolby and Auto Reverse. Whoa. Lovely bit of early 90s cassettery. And below that, the 12 volt socket, tiny weeny little ashtray cubby hole thing, and a little red LED, which is uh, obviously screwed in aftermarket because there's a spy ball uh, alarm system added to this car, which I think is probably from when it was new. Now we move back to the other driving controls, the handbrake. This is one of the biggest things in the car, the handbrake. Then we've got the gear shift. It's just a little nubbin that pokes out of the, the uh, transmission tunnel. It's barely any taller than your hand, so you can just grasp up your hand and shunt it through the gears. I don't think an auto was even an option in this car, not in the UK market. This is a five-speed, obviously. It's kind of a hard rubber um, gear shifter so it won't freeze your hand or burn your fingers in the summer or winter. Behind that, the front two windows are electric, which is nice. And then we've got a nice big cubby hole, which is lockable for security because obviously convertible. And inside there, there's not a lot of room. It's just big enough to lose an iPhone. Just, only just. And your fuel filler cap release is hidden in there. And behind that, we've got just two more things. We've got our courtesy light, which is uh, the tiniest little light in the weirdest place ever. I'm not sure it's going to do much to illuminate apart from your elbow. And behind us, we've got a secondary tea shelf, a large area for sandwiches, snacks, any other confectionery you want to bring with you in the car can tuck in behind the seats in this high level tea shelf. And over in the passenger side, we've got two things. We've got a little tiny weeny glove box. I mean, it's really, really diminutive. Uh, and the uh, bonnet release is tucked inside there. And down in the far corner, there is a fire extinguisher. Right, so let's set off in the cappuccino and see what this little tiny sports car is like on the road. Oh wow, you can feel the urgency of the engine straight away. It's a mad, revvy little thing. Wow, this is brilliant. There's a little green light on the dashboard which flashes all the time the turbo is spinning, which 
even on this oops, oops, right hand indicators, even on this very short drive, is most of the time. It feels so rapid. I'm doing 40 miles an hour right now and it feels like I'm absolutely flying along. The car is just so absolutely tiny, you are completely wrapped up in it. I'm going to put the headlights on because it's quite low sun today. I know I'm in a tiny, tiny vehicle. This car is currently for sale at Stone Cold Classics at Rutum in Kent. It is fantastic and they've got a lot of other very interesting and potentially unique cars for sale down there as well. If you're interested in taking a look, have a look at the website in the description below. So thanks for letting me take it out today. Oh, a Cherokee. I would love a Cherokee. Now, despite its diminutive size, this is actually a proper driver's car. Apparently, when there are two passengers in it, it is set up for perfect 50-50 weight distribution. So, even though it looks like a toy car, you can have full-on, full-size fun with it. The steering is so, so sensitive and so quick. You have to be quite careful with your inputs because otherwise it kind of jinks and wanders across the road. It's such a tiny little thing on those little, tiny, narrow pram wheel tires. But the ride though is surprisingly good. It doesn't feel like you're jittering around too much and this road surface is quite bad as you may see from the shaking of the camera right now. But it rides quite smoothly. It's quite a firm ride. I have to say I can feel the bumps and things through the seat and the pedals and the, and the steering wheel. But I'm not losing any fillings over it. Pedals are absolutely tiny. I mean, luckily these boots I've got on are quite narrow today. So I can sort of squeeze my foot into the accelerator without too much aggro. Now this has got the five-speed manual in it. It's a little bit notchy, but this car has only got 4,000 miles on it, so it hasn't really worn in yet. Turbo lights on. Ooh, barely brushing the throttle and the turbo lights on. This is a perfect solution for someone who doesn't know or can't decide if they want a convertible or a t-top or a coupe because this car is everything whatever the weather is like today you can make it perfect for you. in fact i kind of wish i'd left it as the hard top today because it's a little bit chilly now there was no left hand drive variant of this car everything was right hand drive because really it was a japan only model that got just stolen by britain to have a few for us to enjoy as well they never engineered a left hand drive version with a t-shelf on the right because this was really Suzuki's first sports car, they kind of borrowed heavily or leaned heavily on their motorbike engineering expertise and history. And you can kind of feel that in the way it's just such a darty feeling car. It just takes the tiniest little input from the steering wheel and you are all across the road. So sharp and so, so quick. Actually, this is about as close to a pre-war British sports car, or even as the early 50s sports car, as you can get. It feels absolutely tiny. You wear it like an Austin 7 or an MGA or something like that. You're totally involved in it, even though it's power-assisted ABS, um, air conditioning and safety is a thing in this car. You do still feel so connected, so open with the world around you. Oh, this is enormous fun. I mean, this is just a grin factory. That you do feel a bit exposed when you pull up and there's a truck behind you, for example. You do feel very little indeed. But for the most part, it's not really a problem. Now, turbocharged and intercooled may well sound like the stuff of rally legends, but with only 675 cc's, it's not that powerful, obviously. 0 to 60 is 8.2 seconds and top speed is 85 miles an hour. But the way the thing delivers that power, it always feels urgent, rapid, much faster than it actually is because you're so low to the ground. And let's face it, in a car this tiny, you really want to be going much quicker than 85 miles an hour. So it's all fine. 
But in a way, that's a good thing because it's great having a sports car you can enjoy as a sports car, you know, pushing it around, feeling it grip, feeling the grip just start to go as those tiny weenie tires have got just enough grip to keep it you know, square on the road, but not much more. So you can have lots of fun with it at not a very high speed, a bit like the GT86. So you don't have to be breaking the speed limit, risking your license and everyone's safety to be having a great time hooning in your little car. This is a great, great car. Now the condition of this specific car is overwhelming, it's astonishing. There were only, what number did I say earlier, about 1100 in the UK at all throughout the entire production run. But the person who had this car had two of them. One was bought as a daily driver to actually use, and the other one was kept in the garage for special occasions, high days and holidays, and just to look at. So, as I say, it's only done, well, 4,834 miles. And this is a car which is 28 years old. My Rover Coupe is about the same age as this. It's done about 135,000. I wish it was in anywhere near as good condition as this. The steering wheel is very upright and your fingers are right on the controls. Because the cockpit is quite little, your knees are tucked a bit into the bottom of the wheel and there's not really anything in terms of elbow room over to the, to the right of the driver. Everything does feel very, very close to you for the simple reason that it is very, very close to you. But with the elbow just tucked slightly back behind you, the gear shift is just under the palm of your hand and you can just notch it between sort of second, third, fourth quite happily as you scoot around the road. The brakes are sharp and there's no real mass to the car to make it have to, to work to stop. So the brakes are nice and sharp, there's good feel in the pedal. And because it's rear wheel drive, you do get that proper sports car experience. You can feel the power pushing in behind you as you accelerate out of a corner. Everything is to like about this car. And because it's a 90 sports car, it's kind of softly sprung enough to be comfortable. I could happily just keep on driving this car for several more hours. Oh wow, I don't have any GoPros of picking up that Subaru, but that sounds awesome. Well, thanks for joining me today. I do hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this minuscule but massive fun little sports car. I've had a great time driving this brilliant little car. I hope you've enjoyed watching it. If you have, please hit like and subscribe as always, and I'll see you again next time driving something completely different.